technology is moving faster than the governments are able to respond and reply to this. We're seeing this over and over again. The governments are trying to pass regulations and pass laws to limit what technology is doing, but they're years behind. And it's only getting faster. In my opinion, I think it's going to make governments look incompetent and irrelevant as this continues to move. And it's going to reprice assets and value from what we know. We are literally in an old dying system and it's impossible for most people to see the new system that's being built and being designed and what the world can look like. But I am joining today with Jeff Booth. He's the author of a book called The Price of Tomorrow and he is on the forefront of this, thinking about what tomorrow looks like in this new system. Now, I'm just gonna warn you in this conversation, a lot of things you're gonna hear, you're gonna be like, ah, oh, well, that can't be true, that's not gonna work, but what about this? And that's because you're so used to being in this existing system that we have. We're gonna talk about what this new system looks like. We're gonna talk about this explosion of Wall Street just starting to catch on to this and what that means. We're gonna talk about um, some of the risks that this movement has and how he is helping other people like you and I build the world that we want. It's an amazing conversation with Jeff Booth, the author of The Price of Tomorrow from Ego Death Capital. Let's go ahead and jump in with Jeff. All right, Jeff Booth, the author of The Price of Tomorrow, a book that has Oh man, really sent people into a different direction. Awesome book, Price of Tomorrow and Ego Death Capital. Uh, I don't know, maybe prolific tech investor, entrepreneur. We'll see. Anyway, Jeff, thanks so much for joining me today. <laughs> Great to see you, my friend. Uh, man, so much to talk about. We were having, a, having fun catching up, just talking about fun personal stuff, snowboarding and surfing and taking trips and things like that. But uh, I think we're both also thinking that a lot of this uh, Bitcoin technology stuff is also fun as well. So I want to dive into that. Um, the technology is is advancing so fast and sort of imagining where this goes in the world and how we're rebuilding and changing things, uh, how lives can change, how humanity can flourish. That's the exciting part to me. I've, I've often said that the price is sort of the least interesting thing, but let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, the Bitcoin ETF is the news. I mean, that is just dominating the news. Um, I don't like that because it's mostly just about an investment kind of a viewpoint of it, a number go up technology, if you will. Um, but you know, in, in, as a tech entrepreneur, you know, you have sort of this diffusion of innovation and there's a chasm that has to be crossed. Maybe we're doing that. What's your thoughts on the Bitcoin ETF? Let's dig into that a little bit. Yeah, probably similar to you. I think, uh, if, if you, um, think about how many people understand Bitcoin right now in the world, and you said, say, say that's a, a 1%. Um, and then, how many people really understand what it means and how things are, are going to change to it. We can explore some of that, uh, through this podcast if you want, but that would be probably 5% of the 1%. So the, how small a number of people actually understand what's happening here in this asset class. And I know what's happening is the technology is being built on top of this asset class and what's going to happen, what it does to the existing system. It's such a tiny piece of, of, of the overall market um, <clears throat> that no wonder people are confused. And so now if you put in perspective with uh, that, with what uh, the ETF is doing, it's just bringing more awareness to this asset class. And, and what ends up happening in this asset class is people start to see, wait, I'm living in a system with manipulated money, a manipulated ledger. And that's the reason why prices are going up. And then they learn a little bit about Bitcoin. Maybe they learn about it because they think, um, okay, that'll protect me. It'll give me a hedge against a system that's failing over time. And then some of those people over time learn more and more about it and start shifting more and more of their attention into it as they understand it more. So if you just look through that lens of the ETF, you'd say, well, it's great. It's just, a, it's, it's marketing that is going to bring a whole bunch more of awareness about what's happening to money and how you can um, protect yourself from money being debased. Um, and people are going to protect themselves because of that. From there, the question is how many people remove to self custody and, and uh, as well. Um, and I think you have to look at some of the things that you see in the world today is, is, behind the scenes being coordinated and I, and whether they are or not, I think it's worth thinking that way. Um, 
And why I say that is, is if you, if you said, um, human nature, if you could, if you could get, if you could steal the productivity that should flow to society in the form of lower prices by controlling money, human nature says that will always happen, right? Greed will make that happen no matter what. And we've always lived. So all throughout history, greed, greed will make prices thing. drop. You're saying, no, no, no. So the, a fr the this natural state of a free market is deflationary right so 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 there is no inflation over a long enough time period because what we do we use things that give us more value right why why you're using riverside right now mm -hmm. an app to create this podcast is it gives you more value and if something competed with riverside that didn't give you more value and it costs more you wouldn't use you wouldn't use it right if something gave you more value and cost less, you would use it. So everything we use creates more, we use, it gives us more value. And that means the natural state has to be deflationary of a free market. The only reason things are inflationary, um, short of short term cycles, right? With, with the supply constraint or something. But then what ends up happening is the free market, because of the margins of that supply constraint, entrepreneurs attack it and create a different way of a model to create abundance. And so the natural state over a longer term is always of a free market is, is deflationary. Yeah. We've always lived in the opposite and, and we live in the opposite because effectively, if you could steal a small amount of money from everybody over time, you can aggregate a massive control for doing nothing. So human society always has been wired. If you could game it, you would, right? That's why gold gets corrupted. That's why you fractionalize systems. That's why eventually you go back to, you go to war because it breaks worlds so much that then somebody says, I'm going to reset the system on a new standard. And then it, then it goes through that again. So, so natural state is free. We've always lived in the opposite. That means every history book that anybody has ever written has this error code in it. It also has the error code because we never had something decentralized and secure that could be decentralized and secure throughout time. And the winners write the history books. So it means all of our previous history to the, to this point before Bitcoin was built with this error code. And so it makes total sense that people are confused with what this new insight drives forward rather than looking through the past. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. Now, what are we up against? What is Bitcoin up against? If you have a system that's 10,000 times bigger, that gains its power by stealing yours, right? By stealing money. Um, then what is it up, uh, up against? It's up against all human action doing that. And I'm going to get in specifically how that works. And it is also up against some coordination of, you could say the ETF, um, if the ETF and what Warren is doing at the same time to try to make self -cust, uh, 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 self custodial illegal, right? You, and, and the ETF can short and create, uh, uh, fractionalized on top of Bitcoin and then acquire more Bitcoin. Then you could say, and, and it, it's worth thinking that that could happen because then you're immune from it. Um, but if that was coordinated, I'm not saying it is, but if that was coordinated, what would happen in that world is a whole bunch of people would trade their Bitcoin or they put paper Bitcoin in as, as the ETFs acquired more and more Bitcoin. And you could create that leverage to suppress Bitcoin's price. Um, just like, uh, just like gold has been suppressed, right? For the, and you could create effectively unlimited leverage in that system over to over time and paper contracts to Bitcoin. But, but for people that are scared of that, um, and, and I'm not saying some of that won't happen in the short term because, because, because an office action by a Warren, uh, making, uh, it will drive fear in the market. At the same time, people could short it, could drive uh, price in the short, short term going down. But what would that then cause? There's too many people in the world right now, and Bitcoin is self-custodial, and every year it gets more decentralized and secure. There's too many people in the world that have looked behind the curtain 
And once they've looked behind the curtain and how money works, they're never going back. And so you probably run a node. I run a node. I'm, I'm not selling my Bitcoin. <laughs> um, and every time price fall, uh, fall, falls, well, actually, I buy it anyways. But there's more and more people, Bitcoiners, that understand this, that are going to take that into self-custody. So, so the reaction to the system driving, uh, trying to financialize this, creates more self-custody custody at certain prices and and as that happens eventually if 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 it was coordinated if there was something and again not saying there is but if it was and that was an attack vector for bitcoin what would end up happening is it would cause them the biggest short squeeze the world's ever seen eventually and on that short squeeze would liquidate financial players that were 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 per, um, not acting uh, with integrity or honesty because Bitcoin doesn't care. It's imposing uh, fair rules on society rather than, and it, it, it could care less. It could care less about you, me, everything else. It's just imposing that discipline. Wow. A lot to unpack right there. I was making some notes. We can come back to them. Um, I asked you if uh, to clarify something, and, and I had it wrong, but it got me thinking. You, uh, I said, so it's it's greed that drives prices down. You said no, but if you think about it, in a true free market, if if we could stay free and not be co-opted and gamed, um, so in a true free market, it almost would be greed that would drive prices down. Because if I saw you were making a killing in a certain category, my greed would say, well, I want to step in in front of Jeff, and I'll make a little bit less, right? Yeah. And so. Yeah, it, it Sorry, go ahead. Keep going. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's interesting when you kind of flip it on its head and you have to kind of put that in sort of parentheses in a free market because, you know, what we're being told by the leaders is it's greed that's driving prices up. Right? It's these greedy gas stations that drive prices up, et cetera. But in a free market, greed would actually drive prices down. Um, it'd be the opposite. We only get we, we get paid. Entrepreneurs get paid when they create more value for others, period. Right. And and that's a competitive process. And, and so they, they see, and, and in a free market, that competitive process continues to attack. And where would an entrepreneur go? Would you go to create the next calculator app? Yeah, not, not that's today. already free. <laughs> yeah. Or would you, or would you go create, or would you go attack an industry that had high margins? Of course. The green. It, it makes perfect sense. Right? So the free market is constantly under attack by entrepreneurs. There is no monopoly in a free market. Yeah. There can't be. So in, in, you know, in this diffusion of innovation, you know, this bell curve, and you have sort of the innovators, the true believers, and then you sort of have this chasm. And the chasm is where something has to shift you know, in the mindset of people to sort of bring that early majority in. And there's lots of things that could cause that shift to happen, that, that chasm to be crossed, if you will. Um, I think the ETF is a big piece of that. So all these people who think, well, it's just magic internet money. I don't trust it. It's a scam. It's a tulip. It's whatever. It's too difficult. I don't, you know, throw it, fill in the blank. Um, all of a sudden they're like, well, shoot, if uh, my fan financial advisor tells me to buy it, if BlackRock has it, if, it, you know, whatever. And so that creates the, the chasm to be crossed. And also there's also another paradigm. And so I gave a presentation at Big Buck Boom and Pack Bitcoin on, um, you know, technological revolutions. I talk about them quite, quite often. And um, I, got, I got this from this book, uh, Technological Innovations and in Financial Capital by Carlotta Perez. And she talks about sort of this change and the, reason, the things that these technologies have to do in order to sort of have this revolution. And some of that is in the mindset. And so sort of we have this normalcy bias. It's a recency bias. Hey, money always has to go up. Hey, this is just how it goes. Um, and so that has to change, but there's people that are entrenched in that, that don't want that to happen. Um, and so we have to sort of fight against that. That's sort of this orange pill movement, if you will. But you mentioned one more thing and, and is that, um, Ludwig von Mises called it the crack up boom. And then he said, yeah. and then suddenly the people realize that inflation is both permanent and intentional. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you know, maybe in the last 10 years, inflation has been sort of thrown into the forefront of things. Uh, the Fed is sitting there saying, our goal is to get it back down. We only want 2%. Oh, so it's intentional that you want to steal from me. And I think uh, people are doing that. And so sort of bringing this together, that chasm, not only being uh, brought sort of uh, legitimized 
by uh, Wall Street jumping in. But then also the chasm being crossed where people are suddenly waking up to the fact that in inflation is permanent. And, you know, to the point that you're that you've made, I think everybody realizes I have to go protect my wealth. And when you when you add those two things together, I mean, it's a pretty big hopefully it'll be a pretty big shift to get people to sort of see that new world. Yeah. So think about yourself and I'm, let's, let's go. Um, why does this exist? Uh, and, and how much do you know about Bitcoin and how much of your time is in Bitcoin and then play that forward and how, and, and just th say, how much was it three or four or five years ago mm -hmm. as you started to understand and how much is it now mm -hmm. and how much will it be? And then let's walk through how this works and so so how this works so we've already we've already made a, a, a point the free market is deflationary right the natural state of the free market is deflationary so that means every single person that says yep and then goes on and carries on their life in the other world is making the other world stronger to their own to their own demise right Every single so the amount of time that you're measuring from the other system, if you can say yes, and prices fall to the marginal cost of production over time, and technology is a lever on that, and it's an exponential lever that makes prices fall faster, then what you're doing by trying to capture wealth in the existing system, all of the things in the existing system are making everything worse for you. And let me just show you how that works. <clears throat> so... So you know you know this, uh, Mark, that, that the Magnificent Seven, the tech companies, without the return of the tech companies, S&P would be negative. Right. Okay. So so what everybody does, everybody, um, you do, other, I'm not saying you do, but, uh, the, um, but many people listening to this call will store their wealth in these tech companies. And then they'll use the tech companies that are using AI to reduce the labor because they use the tech companies because if they don't use the tech companies, they don't get the same value. And so the tech companies are creating this artificial and general intelligence that is reducing the labor. And, and you should have it in a normal market. You would probably have about 5% deflation per year, compounding, getting more and more. So even at that, if you were at 0% inflation, you'd be getting 5% stolen from you a year. And you go and spend more of your own money trying to protect your money from losing value by putting it in the tech company. And they, they use that at creating the monopoly and re reducing more and more labor to make, uh, to, to drive that faster, to give you more value. Fair. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and so then you say, well, how is this monopoly doing this? And, but, but if they increase their labor rate, much more or much more labor you wouldn't use their service anymore somebody else would beat them so and then the pension funds that hold your uh, hold your retirement are all indexed to the same thing so they're driving more and more money into the thing that's driving for faster and faster uh, deflation and you're part of your every single person in the world is trying to store their wealth in those things because if they don't they'll lose more money faster now let's look at the same uh, thing on Bitcoin. Bitcoin, all of those companies priced in Bitcoin are losing value. Every one of them. All your houses, all your real estate is losing value against Bitcoin. All of it. But most people are storing their wealth within the system that's debasing. Making it stronger, thinking they're winning on a losing game. And Bitcoin could care less. It's so this system is based on an, a manipulated ledger and it's manipulating currency units and everybody and, and you're voting in that system to who should win, who should get more of the mon manipulated currency units to put to their group or the other group. And, it, and society is breaking everywhere because of this, but every single person, in fact, many of the podcasts you listen to are yelling at the same system. And they don't know they're making it stronger by yelling at it. Right. They're, all of their actions are making it stronger. And so what I, why, why we created ego death and why I just was tired of it. I just said, it's nonsense. 
I wanted to spend instead of 90% of my time in the system that was creating this, I wanted to spend 95, 100% of my time in the system that was repricing it. But if we, so let's, let's take that, we'll transition to Ego Death. So Ego Death is a, is, is a fund that you're in uh, that invests into Bitcoin companies that are building this new, this new world. Um, but let's just take that, that previous example. I had a good conversation with uh, uh, a good friend, mutual friend, uh, Jimmy Song. Uh, many conversations. We, we ended up at a lot of places at the same time. Uh, but in, in L.A. at Peck Bitcoin, and we were talking about this specifically, um, and, you know, he's such a Bitcoin uh, purist, Maximus, that you should just buy Bitcoin and not invest in anything. But I'm like, you know, who's going to go build this thing, right? We have, we, we have to invest our money. But back to kind of the point that you just made, right? So we're investing into Facebook to uh, make our lives better, right? We're getting value from that. Uh, it makes my communication cheaper, easier, faster, et cetera. So I have more value there. But I'm putting my money into that system that's causing, I'm, I'm perpetuating that system that's actually causing me to have this inflationary force. Um, and and then, I yell at other, then I yell at other people because it's their fault. Right. But, but I do it. <laughs> but if I'm putting my, if I'm investing my money into Facebook in order to protect my value, I'm hoping that Facebook is going to go up faster than the uh, inflation that is debasing my value at the same time, right? Yeah. And it's not. It's, it, it, it's, it's not. It's going up at the same rate. Um, um, so if you look at the monetary, if you look at the monetary easing of about eight and a half, the liquidity of about eight and a half percent per year compounded, and then so it, again, or or maybe some of those companies beat it for a very short period of time. But over the long sure. the long term, you're just matching. You're the same as housing, right? So yeah. Exactly the same as housing. Well, I mean, you, the S&P 500 is like a perfect proxy for inflation, I, I think, I think yep. is what we're saying. And, and the yep. median U.S. real estate is as well. Totally. However, there are scarce assets that then outperform inflation. So, for example, median U.S. real estate went up about 40 percent. Austin, the fastest growing city in the United States for the last 20 years, went up about 40 percent. But homes on the lake, lakefront, uh, lake, lakefront on Lake Travis went up 150 percent. Yeah. Right. Uh, so sort of the S&P 500, which the Magn Magnificent Seven sort of make up and drive that, have kept up with inflation. A few will outperform it for certain periods of time if you're a really good trader. Exactly. Right. Exactly. OK. Um, but then contrast that to, okay, so I am an investor or I'm just a regular person. I'm a doctor or whatever. I'm making money. I have savings. I want to protect that savings from de being debased. And so I can put it into NVIDIA, Facebook, et cetera. And hopefully that will at least keep up with it, potentially beat it. Or I could put it into XYZ Bitcoin company, which is also a tech company, which is also hopefully going to beat it. I mean, so what's the no. really... So, 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 so what's different here is... The nine hundred trillion dollars of global wealth. Imagine you you have a percentage of that ledger, right? And you could say, like, if Mark Moss has a million dollars, you could just calculate exactly what percent you have of that ledger. If that ledger is one point five quadrillion tomorrow, because there's a whole bunch more manipulation of money, and your part of that ledger doesn't go up by that amount, you lost money, but you didn't know you lost money. Sure, that's what that's what you're living in. And that's what everyone is pricing uh, there is in. And when they naturally say, what is Bitcoin price in this ledger? They're making that calculation error. When I say it's saying decentralized and secure on the, on the, on the base ledger, then it is inevitable if it stays decentralized and secure, it reprices everything in the 900 trillion. So you could say, how much of a percentage of 21 million do I have? for all of time and, and compare and contrast how much do you need for your living, uh, li uh, lifestyle. If you can hold it decentralized and uh, secure, it will reprice everything else. So then, so then your next question I think is, why would I invest if I can invest in that um, asset? Essentially, I, if I can own a new, if I can own the new internet, not just the value on top of it, but I can own a piece of the new internet and all future value accrues to me. Or is that another way that I like to say it is if prices should fall to the marginal cost of production, if the free market is, um, is deflationary, then the only thing that can measure it is a fixed currency. So in other words, all things forever, if you measure in Bitcoin will fall in price at the same rate, they should fall in price. 
as long as it stays That's decentralized what, uh, and secure. Right. <laughs> right. And so, so now, what, and the only reason I say if it stays decentralized and secure, I think it's a, a, almost an inevitable or a, a point something, uh, one probability that something could bre uh, break it. Why I say if it stays decentralized and secure is so people do their own homework on why that's inevitable. Okay. So, so because they need to understand this, this asset class is different than anything they've ever seen. And they're through the, through the fiat machine of, of manipulating money, they won't see what's unique. They have to do the work because all of the, all of the information that is in the fiat machine would try to stop this from, yep. from working. So then, um, First of all, uh, for the listeners, uh, of course, Jeff and I agree on this. I've been an advisor for Tremble Venture Partners for about two years, so I look at all the Bitcoin-only VC stuff, and now I'm a partner with the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund with our mutual friends, James and David and Larry and all those guys. So uh, we're, we're also investing in the Bitcoin space as well. But just to kind of understand this point for everybody that's listening, and even for myself, to be honest with you. So we go back to sort of investing in NVIDIA or Facebook. Um, and hoping to beat inflation, but I'm, in, I'm perpetuating the same system, if you will, so whatever. Um, or I could invest into XYZ Bitcoin company, Anchor Watch, I mean, whatever you name it, right? What you yeah. put on the line. Um, the mechanism is the same. I'm still investing my money, whether that be dollars or Bitcoin, into a company hoping to beat inflation. I'm guessing what you're saying is the difference is how I'm measuring that money. Am I measuring it in U.S. dollars or am I measuring my return in Bitcoin? Yeah, so in, in, in NVIDIA, the, their free cash flows are in the dollars that are being diluted. And so your, your, your entire investment is in the debasing currency. And in this, it is not. So if you're, if you're creating... So, so what I think is happening in, uh, um, in our companies and some of the companies, if you see the... the and by the way, and this isn't just our fund, let's say there's lots of funds in this space, at least the Bitcoin only funds that understand this. Um, your venture, you, you, you can actually get venture returns on top of a venture asset. So the you're, getting, you're asset, getting Bitcoin returns as opposed to exactly. Returns. So our company, our companies are, are, by creating the enabling foundations of the things that drive, just similar to the, like the internet, but if, if you owned a piece of the internet and then, and then the returns and we're collecting more Bitcoin because of the value that they were creating. And if you see some of the rates of the growth of the companies measure in their balance sheets, moving, moving up by acquiring more Bitcoin because they're, because it's denominated in that and their transactions are based in it. You, you have an underlying asset that I like to look at it as in, it's not going up forever. All prices are falling against it forever. But now you're collecting more of that underlying asset. So you can, um, by, by having successful companies. So you, I believe we're, we're going to have venture returns on top of ven a venture type asset. Right. Is so, it, like, uh, it, it, so when I think about that, I think, and, and, and I can't believe everybody's not here. I can't believe there's not more people understanding this because, because I can prove what I just said because it's repriced every as other asset class over the last the the, the, the critic the, the like critic years, would say over years. what time frame right obviously over the over the last fifteen years it certainly has over the last two years it hasn't right so the, but the but any four year any four year cycle it has. And obviously, your cycle. obviously, as a venture investor, like we're thinking long term, seven to 10 years, mm -hmm. typically at a minimum. Yeah. Right. So to your point, yeah. every four years it has. And so if you're thinking and I say all the time, I mean, if you're if you're if you're marking your portfolio to market on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis, like you're never going to make it like uh, Charlie Munger said, the big money's made not in the buying and the selling, but in the waiting. Right. So yeah. waiting for that to develop. Yeah. And keep and, and play and play that forward. But we have a we have a system that you're in measuring your returns every every day in the other system because it forces you to do so because it's debasing so people are trying to store their wealth and most of their wealth is stored in the system that's debasing it's it's insane right it, it, and, and i think when i think about risk return i think even sam is an entrepreneur um i think the best entrepreneurs are actually um aren't risk takers like people think they are 
I think they're really great risk allocators. And the, the, the difference is they look at the risk of where they are now versus the, uh, versus the new and what they're going to do. And so today, when people are looking at Bitcoin, they're looking at the risk of the new and they haven't done the work to understand it. And they think their own system has no risk when all of the risk is in the existing system. So they're, so what, what you're having is terrible risk allocators. And then as they get more, as the system paralyzes them through more fear, right? And you hear the WEF and they yell at it all the time. And all of these things are capturing their attention, making them even worse risk allocators because they're trying to protect their money in the exact same that's thing that's being, being debased. Right. So uh, Bitcoin has re, is repricing everything. I, I go back to another quote from Ludwig von Mises, and I believe he said that um, in economics, there's no such thing as a constant. And so we always had like this commodity money. And so whether we're measuring things in oil or gold, there's no constant there. Like the supply, the demand, the technology changes that all constantly. Uh, but now we have it right now. Bitcoin has a, a fixed limit of supply. So for the first time, we have a neutral asset that does have a fixed supply. So uh, he was right at the time. Uh, now it's different. And so to your point that you're making, it's starting to reprice everything. And if you have a long enough vision and you think at least in four year cycles, if not longer, it is, it has been historically been repricing things. Uh, you feel strongly that it will as, as do I, uh, the, it looks like even Larry Fink thinks it will as well, which is pretty interesting, but there's one thing that you keep saying, um, uh, nothing's guaranteed in, in this life. And you keep saying, if it stays decentralized and secure. Um, I listened to you uh, sort of debate this out with uh, George Gammon, uh, another friend of mine. Yeah. Um, and uh, he has a little bit of a hard time sort of uh, wrapping his head around that part, I think. But you, you had to keep saying over and over and over that decentralized and secure. So that seems to be the risk factor in your mind. So this, this is almost certain as long as those two things stay true. Yeah. So and 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 if you say what what George would say, and I, uh, George is fantastic, and I think really really sharp on how the existing system works, and sharp on history as well of of how these things got uh, co opted, and he would he would use well, human nature won't let it, uh, it will centralize it, and and the question I have is how. How, because because as more people understand this. And remember, this is a different. This is different than gold. It it can't get centralized like gold. It, it's a, you you can self custody this asset yourself, and you can run on your own node. And so what he he says is, well, governments will uh, will will take it over. And and the question you ask is how and to to what end? Because 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 let's let's just imagine this plays forward. Is it, it's playing because you really have to think about if that's true, what would specifically happen to be able to break that? And so the governments, let's say they're going to print more money to be able to make their currency and they're going to lock the doors and they're going to Jenna, uh, Yellen and Warren and everything else. And they're going to uh, conspire and make Bitcoin self custody illegal in the U S so if that happened and it happened all over the world at the same time, yes, then that would slow, it would for a time, the price would fall of Bitcoin. But what it would signal to the world, everyone, is you better move faster on Bitcoin. And as price fell, more and pe more people would self-custody. And I think it would, just like in, in other regions, where, where you lock down a currency and you say you, there's capital controls on my currency, the currency goes underground. And there's a black market currency that actually moves faster and it is the real price. The free market is the real price. Right. And you have a, 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 a Ponzi. So every single one of these things can't actually happen by the free market unless everyone in the world says, yep, I'm, I want to live in a cage. Right. Nobody would do that. It just wouldn't happen. So, so, and, and then, so now let's say that, what does it look like? To, to George's point or to other people who question. So what that would mean is as the currency units inflate faster, Bitcoin is still repricing the world, right? And then, and then what ends up happening is every, every country competes for labor and capital. 
the best people and the best. Camp. And so as this starts to happen around the world, why would it look any different in the future than it's always looked competing for labor and capital? It's just more of the Bitcoiners will have the capital. Yeah. And more of the great talent will be on the Bitcoin layer building kind of abundance for the future on an honest ledger, which would be a high demand in regions that say, we're going to, we're going to build a free market here. The, the, the game theory, right? And the, the, the chance, the odds, the probability of all the governments of the world, all co-opting and deciding at the same time is very slim. Uh, I thought it would be actually impossible. Um, obviously seeing what happened during the COVID pandemic lockdown made me unfortunately think a little bit otherwise. It was pretty well coordinated across the world uh, yeah. simultaneously. So that, that, was a, that, was, that was a shock to my thinking. So I have to kind of keep that in mind. Um, but game theory is there. And so to your point, in, if they did it in, in the West, if you will, Canada, the US, you know, uh, UK, et cetera, um, you still might have El Salvador or, you know, Argentina now at this point or whatever. And then they're going to attract the best and the brightest kind of to the point that you're making. So you sort of have that. But maybe some of the other um, risk factors, if we just kind of want to play this out a little bit, because, again, trying to think, will it stay decentralized and secure? Um, you know, potentially, you know, BlackRock taking over Bitcoin core developers, um, putting, you know, <laughs> bad malicious code in something like that. Now we run nodes, so we don't have to accept those updates. Right. So, so, so us that, yeah. So, so, but again, I think all of these things like that, there, we're used to thinking these giant organizations that control us and they're going to control us and you make them stronger with your own thinking by allowing that to happen. And the people that are moving to Bitcoin and spending their time in this, and by the way, I'm not even talking about what's being built on top, that, that, that if you were some of those people trying to do this, you have no idea what's coming. No idea. Like how fast this is exploding. If you think about Fediment and, and some of this stuff, the, the regulation is chasing where this might have been four or five, six, eight years ago. Yeah, they can't keep up. Not, not where it is today and right. what's happening. And as the more and more people who understand why, why freedom matters start to vote with their, their, their time and money and energy for freedom instead of saying, I'm, I can't do anything because those other people are going to control me. They take the power from those people. Right. That's the repricing event that is happening. So BlackRock looks so big because because our pension funds hold their money in BlackRock because BlackRock has inside ball on the financial system and it's the only way they can have have a return because of the inside ball. And without inside ball on the financial system, BlackRock gets smaller. And where does the money go to? It goes to you. Right? It goes to Bitcoin holders that are repricing BlackRock too. And so the, the, I, the, for the life of me, I can't understand people that say, I can't do this and I'm going to spend all my time for fear. Well, they make the thing that they want to happen, that they don't want to happen, happen faster to them. Right. It's, it's, it's ludicrous yeah. where they're a node in the network. They're a node in this network and good luck convincing me otherwise yeah and they're literally giving money to a company that's working against their own best interest working yeah and i'm not talking about the in the etf i'm not talking about anything else but through through their pension fund through all of their actions and everything else yeah they're they're all of the people at wef right now right are funded by this extraction of wealth from the same people that are yelling at it Think about it. Yeah, to your point, all the people that are online screaming, to your point that you're making, screaming about how bad this is, they want to take away our rights, all these things. Well, why are you giving them your money? Your money's sitting in their, in their pension fund in their account, and that's what they're using to go to fly to Davos to make these types of regulations. In your, in your housing that you're trying to do that, in, in all of these instruments that you're trying to do that, you're making it str uh, str uh, stronger and then yelling at them say, saying, well, um, well, well, you are, so it's not, there is no they, it's us. Yeah. And if, if you take your time and move it to the system, it, it's going to happen anyways. This new system is expanding because once this insight is, is, is found, um, as free people want to build into a free market and, and, uh, and allow what the free market should look like, 
it's going to impose that because the, uh, there's a wall of people moving into that, spending their time and energy. Yeah. And that's why I just cannot believe I get to do this. Yeah. I get to the smartest people I've ever met. Yeah. So I think uh, a couple things, just so back to the decentralized and secure, um, some of it really comes down to, um, I don't know, I guess to your point, the, the education or, or the desire for freedom, right? So if we look at it from this standpoint, um, the war on drugs has been a pretty big failure. I mean, since 1971, they've spent, you know, over $3 trillion and drugs is the uh, number one killer in America right today, right? And so the war on drugs has done nothing. And that's like a physical product that's been, uh, you know, grown, cultivated, packaged, shipped, processed, distributed, et cetera. Bitcoin is de decentralized or more importantly, digital. So it can't be technically seen or you don't have to carry it, et cetera. But the point being more in the incentive mechanism, when they don't tell you not to do heroin, it doesn't make you want to do heroin. But when they tell you that you don't have a right to store your wealth in a way they can't steal from you, it sort of <laughs> makes you want to do that, right? That's why in, the, in America, when they start talking about gun control laws, gun sales go through the roof, right? Yeah. Oh, you're going to take away my freedom? Well, then I'm going to go yeah. act right now. So they're only really speeding that mechanism up. And so, you know, I would say, I was thinking as you were talking, so really what we need is more education to educate people about this. But the reality is, is that we are driven by self-action and self-determination. And so when I have a problem, I go look for a solution. And so when I see my freedom is under attack, <laughs> I'm going to go find the solution to preserving myself from that freedom. And so, um, I mean, I, I suppose, sure, education to continue to kind of keep that in the forefront. But as and this is what I tell people all the time, do you think governments print more or less money in the future? And of course, the answer is more. more and do you yeah. think governments become more authoritarian <laughs> or less in the future? And I think the answer is, of course, more authoritarian until they can't be anymore. And so I think those things are driving it. And as long as we can keep those answers in front of people, uh, they're naturally going to be in, you know, incentivized to go find those. Um, I want to jump into ego death. Um, so you said just a minute ago, sort of uh, when I talked about the whole BlackRock thing, you said if, o if people only knew what was being built and uh, they would realize that the government's years behind where you know, these builders are going. So I want to talk about that. Let's talk about ego death. Um, you just announced that you're starting a fund number two, $100 million, big number. Um, yeah. So one, I'm guessing that uh, there's massive appetite for that. <laughs> that you're seeing that. So tell me about the appetite yeah. Two, there's massive opportunity. Um, so there's more opportunities that you want to get into. And then maybe three, you can tell us about some of these and you don't have to name specifics, but what are some of these things that maybe uh, are running light years in front of where these regulators are? Yeah. So, um, so one, the thesis of the first fund, like many of the other, uh, Bitcoin only, uh, ventures, but the thesis of the first fund was, I thought there was a, this massive asymmetry of knowledge that Bitcoin was this decentralized and secure bedrock that couldn't scale um, for a long time. And that is what made the value. So all you had to do is hold on to it and it create, and you were creating value. So obviously in a free market that if that's what, if it was decentralized and secure and you couldn't scale it and everyone was getting rich by holding Bitcoin, everyone else would naturally create other coins saying, Con, uh, con, using Bitcoin's growth to say my coin is better than that coin because it does X. Right. right. It's a total natural. That would be what the market would look like. Right. We it's saw what this it did playing look like. Out. <clears throat> and, and again, it still probably looks like that uh, today. So the thesis at the time was people haven't done the work on Bitcoin on why it's a different asset class completely and it's repricing everything else. Um, and until they do that work, they're at a massive disadvantage and they're going to invest in all of this kind of shit coins and not non nonsense. And all of those things over time will go to zero. Every other thing other than Bitcoin will go to zero because <clears throat> you would never use a blockchain, um, essentially a high cost database. If it wasn't decentralized and secure, you'd just use a database. Right. right? So you'd never do that. And then at the same time, Lightning because a, because a, a blockchain is a slow, inefficient database, and why exactly. would, why would the you only want th the only thing the the only th the only use case is the decentralized and security, essentially the ledger of money. Right. That it, and is the biggest use case on the planet because money is manipulated. Right. It's the biggest thing that's so when people say it doesn't have a use case, 
Have you looked at how big and bloated governments are? Have you looked at regulation? Have you looked at all of the things that extract wealth from you? That's what it gives back to you. It's the biggest use case that our world has ever seen. And you can't see it right before your eyes. So let me let, so, me, let, let me let me let me play a clip real quick here of uh, yeah. <laughs> of, of Jamie Dimon at Davos saying it doesn't have a use case, but then I think articulating the use case for it. Let me play this clip real quick. Blockchain is real. It's a technology. We use it. It's going to move money. It's going to move data. It's efficient. We've been talking about that for twelve years too, and it's very small. Okay, so I think we've wasted too many words in that. Cryptocurrencies, there are two types. There's a cryptocurrency which might actually do something. Think of a cryptocurrency as an embedded smart contract right. in it, and that we can use it to buy and sell real estate and move data. That may have value. The idea of tokenizing things. Tokenizing things right. that, that you do something with. And then there's one which does nothing. I call it the pet rock, the Bitcoin or something like that. And so on the Bitcoin, you know, there's, first of all, and I'm, I'm not trying to make a joke here. There are use cases, AML, fraud, anti-money laundering, tax avoidance, sex trafficking, those are real use cases. And you see it being used for hundreds, maybe 50, 100 billion dollars right. a year for that. That is the end use case. He said it's only used for basically yeah. crime, right? He said it's uh, avoiding sanctions, uh, AML, KYC stuff. Um, I think he said, you know, sex trafficking, fraud. And it's just a bunch of people trading between themselves. That's exactly so, that's exactly right. It's it's yeah, it's, so, it's, it's to work outside <laughs> of the sanctioned, you know, basically everything is sanctioned at this point. And yes, so we can trade between ourselves. Exactly. So I suspect Jamie Dimon is just a highly paid actor that's and he's highly paid from the money that he skims off the top from that should be in, in your pocket. Right. That's that, that, that's what ends up happening because he sits at the top of a system that must steal the productivity that should flow to society in the form of lower prices right. by his space in the system. So what would a highly paid actor in that system say about a system that gives you back your freedom and power, right? Because it takes, it, it, so of course, but but my point um, is, is he was basically saying the only use case for Bitcoin would be so you could have freedom and power that the state couldn't yeah. have. I mean, he was yeah. making the case for it inadvertently, yeah. right? But yeah. anyway, I, I'm taking you sort of off your uh, thesis for uh, for ego death and going the, the first. Yeah, no, but but again, that's that's what you're up against, and that's what the world is looking at with all of. The, and it's not just Jamie Dimon; it's all of the system that. So if you think about regulation, if you think if you think about regulation today, I've said this many times, but you have regulation to protect your money on top of a system designed to steal your money. <laughs> yeah. Right. What would that look like? Right. Just be, let's just be really honest. Like the free market is deflationary. Um, and that's a big topic. The natural state of free market is deflationary. It's so big, it breaks your brain. So if you can say that and understand that and then go back and say, but I'm going to live in this other world and price from that other world, then it's your own fault that the world looks like it is. From we that viewpoint, the regulation doesn't protect your money from a system trying to steal it. The regulation actually protects them to be able to continue to steal your money because it, it forces you... me to keep a, my money in a system that's rent seekers in every area as opposed to letting me use it freely. Why do you, th why do, why do you think big tech is trying so hard to regulate AI? Why do you think... Why do you think... Uh, 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 why do you think drug companies look like they do? Why do you think food companies look like they're big agriculture? Why do you think it's been co-opted by regulation because right. regulation protects the monopoly. It doesn't protect you. Why do you think regulation is on top of money? Because it protects the monopoly of money, not you. Right. The entire system is, to, and, and just look at the evidence. Every single industry has been uh, driven this way. Why? Because prices fall to the marginal cost of production in a free in a, in a free market. What is the what is the marginal cost of production of a line of code? Zero. Yeah. What's the marginal cost of production of a line of code created by other co lines of code where AI is going? Zero. Right. The only way they can drive the prices up and create the monopoly is through regulation, scaring you that they will protect you from the very same same thing that steals the thing becoming free for you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 
So that is the free market. That's what it looks like. And the regulation on top of it makes it not a free market. And, and that whole thing is getting worse and worse and worse. And people are stuck in that fear loop, making it worse. The only thing that can stop it is something that has no counterparty risk to the existing system outside decentralized and secure. So that was our take. People were so misunderstanding this asset class, they hadn't done the work. They hadn't understand that how this is the first time in history that this is something like this has existed. And we felt sure that it would become more decentralized and more secure over time, which it is. <laughs> um, and then we, then we said, now there's with lightning and other things emerging on top, you can scale in layers like pro, like a protocol like the like the internet scaled in layers and there is going to be more and more ability to build be built on top and that's going to turn into that over time is going to turn into a peer-to-peer -peer internet bounded by energy that creates an entirely uh, new world and so i selfishly i wanted to be involved in that um, when I when I think about uh, I wanted uh, I I knew that Bitcoin was repricing everything else, but I I so at first I had a hedge in Bitcoin and I was spending most of my time in what we just des described, um, and I thought huh, I'm a hypocrite, right? The um, yeah I'll be protected, but I'm spending my time and energy on a whole bunch of company boards in the existing space. Um, and every time a company wins there, money has to be manipulated faster to be able to, to drive up uh, prices. So, and, and, and so I, I thought, if I know this and I can see it coming and I can see similar to what I saw in the internet, um, it's kind of the best and the brightest were moving in this space. What am I doing spending 90% of my time in the fiat world, right? I'm going to spend it all in, 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 uh, in, in this. Um, and I'll tell you, it's, it's been, it's been remarkable because you get to see the, it, it's, I didn't think I'd have another chance to do this. Like in, in the early days of the internet, I remember thinking, wow, people don't see this. People don't see what's coming. It, um, and, and, the type of talent that existed there, it was just, it was, your brain was on fire all the time because it was just, you're learning at such a rate from some of the really, the, some super smart uh, and, 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 and dedicated entrepreneurs and such and capital. This is bigger. This is, uh, this is way bigger. Um, because, because it's the same as the internet, but the best price, but it's aligned with where humans are going. And so it's more meaningful. Um, and so the type of people, the type of integrity that is built into this space, the type of people that actually understand this and are building, it's so much more powerful than, than, than the internet was. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. You know, I talk about it all the time. And you see it if you go to a Bitcoin conference. Um, you know, the mainstream wants to tell us that we align on identities, you know, black, woman, male, straight, gay, whatever it may be. But we, we align on values. And there's some values that I think are more important than others, like freedom and human flourishment, for example. And so to the point that you're making, sort of Bitcoin has attracted the people that care about those types of topics. And when you're in some of these uh, Bitcoin events, I mean, you can just feel it. You can just feel the vibration. You can feel the cool. energy in the room, <laughs> uh, so to speak. And so to your point, um, you know, it's attracted the best and the brightest and really um, maybe crypto has almost sort of helped that right as this great filtering mechanism, because if you only care about the money, you're going to go to the crypto yeah. side. And if you go to the Bitcoin side, you're basically admitting to take less money and to go the long, hard way. And so yeah, only there, because there of your isn't an, there, there isn't an entrepreneur in our portfolio, or I don't think in the Bitcoin space, that would take money from VCs that were crypto VCs. But, um, because you don't want to, you don't want a shareholder that's misaligned with your, your, uh, at that level at the, at an integrity level, right. Or, or that you have to teach about a protocol that's so different. Can you imagine trying to take money from somebody who had no clue about what we're talking about right now? Right. Right. Your values aren't aligned. And so 
so why this is expanding and why it's just it's such a beautiful space. And, and if you just look at the portfolio, the, the portfolio success and what's happening in, in, in the companies that we funded already, um, like I literally can't believe I get to do it. I can't believe I get to work with these brilliant people creating this value for other people and they, and, and they're creating value for themselves and the companies out of creating staggering value for other people and bringing on billions of people to this asset class. That's right. what's going to happen. Yeah. And I, I in, in this presentation I gave, as I said, at a bit block boom and in pack Bitcoin, I was sort of at pack Bitcoin. I put a slide in where I had said sort of, uh, I showed oil, like a can of oil, a barrel of oil. Yeah. And so you have oil like an asset, but then you have the oil industry. So like who made the sonar for the oil tanker to sell across the ocean or who made the satellite tracking to track, you know, or who made the new drill head to go horizontal or whatever it may be. Right. So you have the, the asset Bitcoin, uh, but you have this whole industry of all these things that have to be built. And if we don't invest into that, basically we have a model T in our front yard sitting on blocks because we have no tire shops and no gas stations and no roads to drive it on. And so the sort of the, the challenge was to the Bitcoiners in that, in that presentation was that, Cool. You bought your Bitcoin. You're hodling on a hill, but uh, just like your Model T's on blocks. But if you don't go and help build out this uh, ecosystem, then you don't have roads to drive it on. And so um, there's this entire ecosystem that needs to be built. And so that's obviously we're hoping to return better capital, but it's also potentially like, hey, we just need to build this world that we believe in. Um, so yeah, both. but the and, and, and just building on that, I just, I just think so there's an asymmetry in knowledge just on the asset layer. Right, so l probably less than one percent. I really understand the the asset layer. Probably a lot less than one percent. Even people that hold it don't really understand what, how it's repricing everything else. Now there's a massive asymmetry of knowledge in what you can build on top. And and then you look at this world and you say, there's all these problems. Right, what do entrepreneurs do is they race for the hardest to solve problem, because that's where the return is. Because by solving it, they'd solve it for millions or billions of others, and they create something really magical. That's what. So every time you hear a problem, I just go, "Okay, that's a, the, screaming at me." <laughs> yeah. Here's how how would you uh, how would you solve that? So when you think about this, kind of the the today you could call it uh, Bitcoin, it might not, but. On top of Bitcoin, it might look like a, a um, backcountry roads, gravel roads. The superhighways are coming, right? And all of the stuff that's being built on top uh, on top of uh, on top of this is coming, and it's going to provide incredible value to those entrepreneurs and society by by solving those problems. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, when I when I see a big hairy problem like that, I think that's where I want to go. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So, um, and, and you're doing it, you're building the world that you want. Um, and you're helping other people do the same. Um, so ego death, Bitcoin, uh, ego death fund number two, open and ready for business. And, uh, just maybe this last question, we'll just transition out. Um, I mean, I guess, I think it's already sort of uh, self-explanatory, but this is obviously a much bigger fund number two. Um, and so it's not just the demand to get into this from the investor side, but you're also seeing an explosion of opportunities that need funding to grow as well. So, I mean, we're seeing it on both sides. Yeah. So that, so that's why, so we actually, our first fund, we, we kept small specifically because the ecosystem was small and that would allow us way more time to be really kind of helping the entrepreneurs and spend more time inside some of those companies that would be enablers of what would come. Now those enablers are growing. Some of them are growing extraordinarily fast. Um, it, like blow me away <laughs> completely like the, the, um, like crazy fast. Um, and you, and now in those, you think about the next step, their series A or series B and everything else. And now, the, but there aren't a lot of series A funds in Bitcoin only. There are series A funds broadly and everything else. And those entrepreneurs don't want to go to somebody who doesn't understand Bitcoin for capital. Because that means teaching about Bitcoin and everything else and their business. So we're, that's why that's why the bigger fund, the, the, the entire ecosystem is maturing as you would expect it would mature. 
um, and not just in our portfolio companies. Uh, you, you know this from broadly in the industry. Um, there's a bunch of things that are starting to catch fire. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's an exciting time to uh, be in the space. I agree. We have lots of fireworks. The ETF catalyst, obviously, the halving cycle that's uh, that's that's coming back around as well. Uh, but more importantly, it's the explosion of this technology is going to perpetuate and, and really, more importantly, um, help foster a new era of, of human advancement, human flourishment, et cetera, and freedom, hopefully. Uh, I think with that, we'll go ahead and sign it off unless there's anything else that you want to add or we missed. No, nope. no, nope. just awesome catching up with you, Mark. It's uh, again, our friendship has come from the exact same same thing that you see in this uh, in this ecosystem. And we would say looking outside in, you'd say, OK, the, uh, um, there's there's these fights in Bitcoin and everything else. And you don't have to agree with everybody. But I, th um, and, and that's, and I think uh, a free market makes it stronger by the debates and everything else. And, and so, so it's okay to be different, different and have different views on this. But what, but what you see in this is the really important things, um, are aligned. Yeah. And that's why, 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 again, you can create this kind of type of people that you meet in this, you just, you know, they're going to be lifelong friends. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, uh, so good. So good. I love that. Um, Look forward to catching up with you sometime soon. Um, but with that, we'll sign off. I'm going to put in the show notes down below. Of course, uh, we'll link to Ego Death, uh, your book as well. Anything else that people should be paying attention to? That's no. It. Oh, oh one, one quick thing. Uh, Jeffbooth.ca is my website. And the only reason I say that is if you're going to follow me on social media, make sure the social media that I'm on is on that website mm, because there's just too many fake accounts. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right, Jeff. Thanks so much. Thanks, buddy.